just me putting in any X amount of my uh, uh, time at work was taken away my, from my mental capacity. My, 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 it's causing me stress. It's, 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 it's draining my soul. So I, then I realized, oh, man, I can't really be good at this if I'm being drained five days a week. Welcome to Expanding Wallet, home for empowerment. We inspire greatness and help you learn skills for creating generational wealth. My name is Andrew Clark, and I'm the founder of Expanding Wallet. Do you feel like you have something great inside of you, but you don't know what it is? Or maybe you feel like you are not doing what you're really meant to do. Well, this guest had those same feelings. He came to America at 14 years old, barely speaking any English. And by 22, he was doing what was expected of him by going to college. But the path of obtaining a degree and getting a job didn't seem very appealing to him. So he wasn't very excited about his future until he gave comedy a try. It wasn't an easy journey for him because Sometimes, even when you know what you're meant to do, you still have to face your fears. And I know his story well, because I was there even before he ever took the stage. He's one of my best friends, comedian Ali Sultan. Ali has been on Kevin Hart's show, Heart of the City, won multiple comedy competitions, and he's even flown all the way to Dubai to do a Comedy Central special there. And most recently, he made his national TV debut on The Late Show, as well as just releasing his second album, Funny First. In this interview, you are going to hear what it took for him to bring his dream into reality. And I'm curious to know, after watching his interview, what do you take from it and will apply to your own roadmap to success? Leave that in the comments for me to read. Here's the interview with my friend, comedy star, Ali Sultan. Hey, how you doing today, bro? I'm doing good, brother. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. Happy to have you on the show. I'm excited. uh, Let's just, yeah, let's just kick it right off. I want you to describe what life was like before coming to America when you were back in Yemen and you even lived in Ethiopia for a while. So why don't you just share what that was like? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's, a, that's a heavy question right, right off the bat. Huh? Right off the bat. <laughs> that's starting real strong. Uh, uh, Yemen and Ethiopia are different from one another. Um, so I, I'd say, I, I, you know, the first 10 years of my life was in Yemen. Um, uh, I think the first six, seven were amazing. First six for sure. Because, you know, you're a kid, you don't know. You don't necessarily know your surround, like understand the world around you. So you know, um, I was just playing a lot. I was out, you know, in Yemen. You know, like uh, everybody, like we lived in a small um, community where everybody knew each other. So you know, you can be outside, play with a bunch of friends, and all that stuff. It, w- it wasn't a safety concern to me. I mean, you can get hurt, <laughs> and get beat up, and sh- and stuff like that, but. You know, no one's trying to kidnap you, I feel like, in Yemen. Maybe, maybe they, I don't know. Now that I think about it, somebody did try to kidnap me once. <laughs> <laughs> so so maybe Yemen. not all that safe. That's Yemen. Yemen is really fun, but you might get kidnapped. <laughs> okay. A lot of a lot of freedom then, right? A lot of freedom in Yemen. Uh, so, yeah. I, you I had a great, joke like that. That's why I brought that up. <laughs> I, I had a great time as a child, man, playing outside. I'd go out early as I can, 9 a.m., and then come back at like 6, 7 p.m., dusty uh, so dusty you know um uh and um you know just have a good time and then i but, but at seven you start you know understanding the world around you a little better you start seeing kind of like the 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 good and bad you know what i mean yep. you start you know noticing certain things about um uh, people that you're around and whatnot so after uh, yeah after seven i, I had more of uh, more of not an objective but more of an objective view of my uh, my uh, my uh, surroundings. So I don't know how deep you're trying to get, but uh... that's okay. <laughs> no, we don't we don't got to go too deep, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and then and then you ended up in Ethiopia before coming to the U.S. So um, yeah, um, my, my um, like? sorry, 
Oh no, go ahead. I was saying, what was Ethiopia like? Oh, what was it like? So I'm I'm a mix of Ethiopian and Yemeni, right? So I was born in Yemen. Um, we have roots in Ethiopia. My mother thought I would be better off with my aunt who lived in Ethiopia uh, uh, while she was in America and, and doing the paperwork and trying to get us, me and my sister to come to America. So we had, you know, she didn't know how long it was going to take. I remember she told me it's going to be like a year. <laughs> Four years later, <laughs> what up? <laughs> how many years later was it? Four years. <laughs> Four years instead of a year. So, yeah. I know you like have a joke on that. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty much purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was emotional purgatory, uh, but it was a beautiful uh, country. It's a lot more, uh, uh, I'd say, civil than Yemen. You know, what I mean, more educated folks, um, um, pretty peaceful. We were pretty poor when I when I got there. It was like a, a I experienced a different level of poverty. I've never identified mm -hmm. as poor because you know, mm -hmm. you know, growing up in Yemen, I had my needs needs met. You know, you know, I can you know eat whenever I want, and you know, I have basic needs met. But in Ethiopia, man, that, that was a different level of poverty for my specific family. There are people that are well, well off in mm -hmm. Ethiopia. I don't want to give the image that we're all starving over there, you know. Uh, right. But uh, my specific situation was was different. Like it was, I remember having to um, like hustle so I can eat eggs, that type of part. <laughs> I know you got a lot of jokes on that. That's why I, I wanted to bring that up but uh you have a joke really, that i really love really jokes, um, but like i remember I, I there's this kid who used to bring a, a, a egg sandwich to, to class yeah. and I would, I would give him my bus money so i can have the egg sandwich and then i would walk three hours home sometimes wow that's a long walk. that level of poverty never experienced it before <laughs> wow like that and that, you know, I've, I've, like I'm uh, 10 years old or whatever, but like, as that was happening to me, I wasn't perceiving it as like, man, I'm poor. I'm like, this is, this is not cool. I'm, <laughs> I'm better than this. I should have eggs when I wanted to and take the bus. <laughs> yeah. Cause your perspective, you already had a different perspective from, from yeah. where you were before to now where That's, you are. Isn't that the, the privilege the of the privilege on, on your like forming years and, and the way you're brought up to the world? That, that exactly. stuff is really powerful, man. Because if, if I started not affording eggs from the get-go, I would have a different mentality. I would have like a poor exactly. person mentality, you know what I mean? Exactly. I could be like, you know, not, no disrespect, but it could be like limiting to what you think is possible if you think that way. Exactly. It, absolutely. Your mindset yeah. is so powerful uh, and yeah. what you believe is possible. And um, I did want to say, though, because we were talking about Ethiopia and, and the poverty one of your fa one of my favorite jokes of yours is when you talk about the comparison of like Ethiopia to America, and you know the joke I'm talking about about hearing the rap music, and oh, hearing them that's talk about that was my street. first like first one of the first five jokes I wrote. That's no <laughs> that joke that's no longer in my act. <laughs> <laughs> but that joke to me was a killer because you talk about how in the I think, rap let me music, see if I can remember it. This is I don't do the joke. Right, you do it. But the just of the joke was. Uh, like the, I was trying to describe the poverty that I experienced in Ethiopia. And I go, I remember uh, it's one time me and my friends, you know, put in like saved up for six months to buy a cassette tape. <laughs> and we played the cassette tape and it was a rapper saying like, uh, I'm from the streets, like something about like feel my pain. I'm from the streets. I'm from the projects. And then we're all like, oh, my God, they have streets and projects. They're balling over yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He was like, "They're balling streets and projects. They got it yeah. good over there." I, I remember when I came to Minnesota, and then I I worked in uh, in the like the you know hood for lack of a better word. I, I worked in uh, West Broadway and uh, like just the it was called the murder station. Like uh, that's that that was like gas station that I worked in. Uh, yeah. So shout out for my mom and uh, stepdad for putting me at the murder station at the age of fourteen and fifteen. <laughs> As a body, uh, as a security guard, by the way, I was the security guard. <laughs> you were the security guard. <laughs> I know, that shit was foul, bro. <laughs> oh my god! It's a bulletproof uh, I'm, I'm uh, gas station. Uh, my stepdad is behind the bulletproof. Meanwhile, I'm outside with gardening gloves because I thought that would make me look tough, and I was like the security guard. <laughs> Fourteen years That's old, incredible. possibly 120 pounds. I, I had no, you know, I didn't get all my vitamins in Ethiopia, so I was very skinny. Uh, but I remember like seeing the that part of, and it's not like 
I'm, yeah, I guess as far as ghettos go, um, they're not. It's not as bad as certain uh, other countries. And uh, but I remember seeing it, and I was like, "This is nice." I saw yeah. the Quran. I was like, "This is nice." They got traffic lights. They got uh, a paved street. Um, you know, <laughs> but you yeah, know, but then, <clears throat> but then you spend enough time, and then you can see like the emotional and mental um, prison that it could be. Right? Yeah, absolutely, and I think that <clears throat> it's such a good point, though. And why I asked you about it is perspective. Um, I've said Dude, this poverty is just... better than oppression. I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> poverty is better than oppression, <laughs> for sure. I like that line. All right. So um, what age then? So you get here, was it 14 or 15? I, I was just about to turn 15. I came here in May and I turned 15 mm-hmm. um, in uh, October of that year. So I just okay. said 15 to kind of simplify okay. it. But. So pretty close to 15. I came in and, with uh, a mustache and a, and a lot of boners. I, I was a horny 15 year old. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> we'll I'm a comedian. We'll Sorry, what, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> right. Yeah, no. I, um, let's uh, talk about what it was like. Five Ethiopian here. boners. I'm just going to go. You, uh, <laughs> when you came here, though, you were not speaking much English. No, not at all, man. I, I watched uh, American movies when I was overseas, and and there would be uh, kind of you know translated like you can read the subtitles in Arabic. Um, I knew some words, you know, but even like in Arabic, when they translate things, they lie sometimes. Like "fuck" becomes a uh, bastard or something, you know, like a lesser uh, profound a lesser profanity word. word. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I, I I knew basic things. I, I I think I knew my ABCs. I I um I didn't know if I knew them like alphabetically, <laughs> but I knew like about order. Them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I knew yeah, like, I knew thank you. I knew okay. I knew just basic. Like I know what you how much you know in Spanish probably. <laughs> probably probably I mean, knew more actually. You can say bathroom. You know. No, no. I I've, I had really limited uh, knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> No, that's good. And you you learned quickly because I met you at 16 in high school. 16, you right? You did. You met me like two years in, into America. Isn't that great? You're uh, one of yeah. my earliest friends in, in America. Yeah, no, it, it was, um, it, it's true. I met you. I wouldn't have guessed that. I wouldn't have yeah. guessed that, you know, you had you only- You gave me that wedgie in wedgie? America. Called a wedgie? Is that what you said? <laughs> I never gave you a wedgie. You put me inside of a locker? I don't remember that. <laughs> oh yeah uh, this is what comedians do 50 percent truth 50 percent we don't know um but no you you've had some great jokes about you know that experience in coming to america um so i definitely encourage people i'll, I'll put some links at the bottom hey, of this uh, check out my colbert set what up what up from yemen to colbert huh huh you guys know what colbert yeah. is and and that's what I wanted to highlight too. I mean, think about this, right? Coming to America at fifteen. I'm, I'm, I'm being. I'm, 14, I'm being. By the way, I'm joking. I'm not like like I'm not. This is not me really bragging. So. <laughs> but but no. But seriously, like coming to America at fifteen to, you know, really not knowing any English, but then to go on to to get to the levels that you did, um, that's pretty amazing. And that's you know why we're doing the interview, focusing on on what it took, but um. I want to fast forward now. So <clears throat> obviously, I know you in high school. Very smart guy. And I was the cube master in high school. <laughs> yes. He, oh, yeah. He was known for the Aruba's cube. Um, he could solve it behind his back, actually, which was very impressive. And the thing that I wanted to kind of jump to is, so now you're in America. You're 22. You're in college. You're doing what's the social norm, going to college, getting a, educated, yeah, but something happens. You're not really sure what you want to do career wise. So, oh yeah, like, man. That like? Oh man. Uh, first of all, uh, my empathy to anybody who's going through that phase in life. I don't know how young your audience is, uh, but I remember 21 or 22 is that phase of like, I know, especially if you're an ambitious person, you know, like me, you know, what I mean? you know, there's something that you know, out of, for like better words, greatness in you. And I think exactly. we all have uh, an aspect of that. And you're like, I know I have this passion and, and, and ambition and I want to put it in the right place. And, you know, I'm told that I should be an engineer because that was an influence I had since I, you know, my, my, I didn't grow up without, uh, I grew up without a father and my family told me that my father was an engineer. 
So, you know, that one idea that the only one thing I had to like hold on to mm -hmm. was the fact that he was an engineer. So I wanted to be an engineer like my father. And, you know, because I was naturally good at problem solving and, and fairly intelligent, um, my family said, yeah, yeah, that, that, that sounds like it will fit you perfect. So I just kind of like, you know, um, you, you know, just thought this is what it's going to be. I'm going to be an engineer. Uh, then college came and I was like, ooh, you know, like once you start like really thinking about it and, and, and thinking about what engineers do <laughs> and all this stuff and the work that, you know, I, I remember you going through college and I mean, it wasn't easy work. It was it was hard. hard, hard no, work. it was probably the hardest thing I've ever done. As you probably are a big influence, you seen the things you had to do to graduate. <laughs> the term You're like, nah. And it wasn't so a matter of like. I changed your course. <laughs> And it wasn't a matter of like, can I get the work? I, I'm sure I could have done the same work that you did. It was a matter of like, I don't think it's worthwhile. So I was like, right. this engineering business doesn't make sense to me. I don't want to do it. My heart is not in it. So I started, you know, kind of like soul searching, trying to find what it is inside of me that 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 I need to do. Um, I knew, and then you kind of like reflect on your early life and college or like so high school and stuff like that. And, and you remember things that people say about you, you know, like if you're a good artist, oftentimes mm -hmm. throughout school and, and your upbringing, your parents and friends would be like, oh my God, you're an amazing artist. You got to like remember these cues, right? So I remember like throughout my time in school and, and being in America, I was complimented a lot on my writing whether it was for like essays or whatever, like I had barely any grammar, you know what I mean? I'm new to the country, but I can like bullshit a paper real well. And I would always You're write creative. it. I, and, I, and I can express well. And then I, I, yep. I, I would write my papers always like an hour before it's due. And I watch people like, you know, uh, panic for two weeks about it, right? And I would do better <laughs> somehow. So I knew that writing was a skill. Yep. And then I, I wrote, uh, <clears throat> I attempted to write a book at that age. Um, uh, I, I, it was trash, but I completed it. And I felt how that felt. You know, I, I knew what, it, what that, what you, I got an idea of what that feels like to write a whole thing that's like yeah. hundreds of pages. Um, I did poetry, felt that out. I tried to rap for a hot second. <laughs> <laughs> you got into Kevin Hart's chocolate dropper moment there. <laughs> I remember those days. Um, <laughs> but then but me, ev everything led to the same thing which is i don't take i have a hard time taking things seriously like hey, there's a mm. one point that i wanted to be an academic you know i wanted to be <clears throat> like you know fucking you know like an einstein type of guy and just be like a theoretical physicist but yeah. i never took life yeah. that seriously <laughs> you know now I, mean? I remember those days that was you in high school and uh yeah <clears throat> I want to say a couple of things. I love though. science I, and I love all that stuff, but I'm not, I'm co too corny to be that guy. <laughs> and, you know. Well, I would, I don't know if it's too corny, but I, I think I'm that. I'm a funny guy. I'm a corny guy. That's fine. Um, yeah. And, I think, yeah. You're more funny than, than what you yeah. would expect from like. When I gave speech, and then, you know, like in school, when I gave speeches, I've, it always like my comfort was always to make jokes. That's how I yeah. got through them. So yeah. eventually I was like, well, I, I, I discovered stand-up when I was 15. And when I saw it, I started writing jokes immediately. Like it hit my core. But I never knew that that's something possible. That's something that you can do. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't even know how do you become a comedian. I just thought you're just a comedian or you're not a comedian. You're either on <laughs> right. TV or you're with us, you know? So I didn't know but there was also, an open... Yeah. No, no. I was but, just going to say real quick, but I knew that you were funny. Like besides the writing jokes. Yeah, you, I'll, I'll get back like, to I'll get back to that. So, so the first time I saw a stand up, so now we're talking about clues of what you should do, right? Mm -hmm. My clue is like the first time I saw it on TV on Conan, I was like, I want to do this. And I wrote jokes and I practiced them by myself. I just didn't know that there's open mics and that's how comedians come about. And I didn't know there was a process that I can be involved in. That was the first time. And then in the summer of that first year in school, I had to take more English classes. Um, my Mexican friend told me I should be a stand-up. Mm -hmm. And then in, in college days, me and you would go to parties and I would like do these characters, right? Yeah, that and was And then it. you were like, you should be a stand-up. You, you were pushing me to do the thing that I, well, I, I, but I just didn't know how to. And then I looked at the way that whole thing happened with the stand-up was <clears throat> we went to an open mic. 
um, we went to an open mic night at Acme Comedy. As the Club. first time I did stand up, yeah. And well, before you did it, we went. No, we, no, no, no. The first, the first time I went to a stand to stand up to a, uh, the open mic is the first time I performed. I've never been no, to no, a comedy. Right. Well, I thought that we went together, and I said, "Ali, you should do this." No, we we went together the first time, and I was about to bail out, and you said, <laughs> "I'm not going to give you a ride." <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I did. Uh, I did push you. So, so yeah. So the backstory is, uh, you you, you were my best friend. So I was like, hey man, let's go together. If I if it wasn't for you being there as a supporter, I don't know if I could have done it by myself. So so we end up, but basically before you even go, before he even goes and performs, he actually practiced like a week beforehand. Takes a week. Mm -hmm. He practices in his garage um, with me actually. So. Um, you know, he, he wrote his jokes, practiced it. And then, yeah, we go now it's showtime and yeah, he's not, he's not trying to go up on stage. Here, bro. Um, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to do this. Man. <laughs> I looked at but, you, um, this open mic is called Acme comedy company. It's a club that's been open for 30 years. It's one of the best clubs in the country. And the open mics would have 300 audience members. So it was like high pressure, you know, it was like this, you know, four room, and it's an intimate theater type of style. And man, you just like, they go, all right, you're up next. It just felt like you're waiting to be slaughtered, like, like that fear, you know? So when my name yeah. was about to happen, I was like, hey, man, let's get out of here. <laughs> so he actually does it. Okay. So let, let's talk about, you know, what does it feel like the first time Can't you went on it. stage? Say that again. Oh, sorry. And I eventually did it. Yes. It was scary. Yes. A lot, a lot. Of it was terrifying until I got that first laugh. <coughs> so to be honest with you, when you did it that first time, it was like, in my mind, I'm like, wow, he's meant to do this. And I'm thinking he's already made it, right? So I'm thinking <laughs> ending it here. And, you know, well, we talked about it Asian. after. We were like hyped up, like, yeah, you're going to be famous, right? So we think like end of the year, he's going to be on TV. I think like in one year. That's how it felt like, yeah. <laughs> and that's how it felt. But then, and I always think and about the second this, time. We, that's uh, what I was gonna say. That's tell them you about know the it. second time. All right. <laughs> now so, you don't gotta use the name of the place, but but tell them about that yeah. second time. No, I'll, I'll use it. Uh, the first time, uh, that, that place hurt my feelings. <laughs> the first time, it was at Acme. I went up, and I, the jokes were whatever. I'm new, right? But I, I I was getting them. I was making them laugh. And then I remember I got up, and this, an audience member stood up and high fived me. I felt like it was the highs of highs. I was like, this feels the best. I'm meant to do this forever. And I was just like, you know, you have all these delusions, right? Then second time, you know, I went back to Acme. You can't just get on every time. It's 50, 55, 60 people showing up every weekend, every every Monday. And there's only 20 spots, like really three to four spots open for people that don't work there. So it was very competitive and you have to have to come out and show your face for like a year to get into that rotation. Uh, so I had, I had to look for other mics. And one we found was in a city of Coon Rapids, uh, emphasis on <laughs> Coon Rapids, uh, and a place, a bar called Willie's. <laughs> and I'm like so cocky. I'm like, I got some new shit. This is my second time on stage. Everything I say is new. <laughs> and then I brought you and I brought Tommy, our friend Tom. Tom? Yep. Tom. Tom is a friend of mine from school. And I, it was kind of like me was trying to show him, hey, I'm cool too. Here's the thing that I do. Because, you know, yeah, like, you know, I mean? I'm a rock star. Let me, let me show you my other side. It does not involve me solving Rubik's Cubes. Um, and then you and Tom sat in the front row. We go into this bar. Uh, it's got heavy meth vibes, right? I would say pretty methy, you know what I mean? Uh, we got this uh, uh, trashy uh, host that goes up. And then when he introduces me, he goes, this guy's from Yemen. Uh, they breed more terrorists than any other country in the world. And this is back when it wasn't cool to be Muslim. You know, now people are like, yeah, Islam is cool. But back then, you can't even tell people you're Muslim because you were just associated with terrorism. Um, yep. And then this dude says this in this methy, like white trash bar, and it gets super quiet. And he keeps like going in about 
facts about how Yemen has a lot of terrorism. <laughs> and at one point he goes, Osama bin Laden's dad is actually from Yemen. Anyways, keep it going for Ali Sultan. And then I show up. If he did that to me now, I would do, I would use that jujutsu. You know, it's like jujutsu. You take that weight and you flip it on them, and then it would be really funny. I would know what to do with yeah. that kind of intro. Yeah. But I didn't know what to do then. I was just practice my material, and I just was going to go up and do these materials. And then I go up, and I freeze. I don't know what to say. I say the first line, and then someone goes, bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Like, remember yesterday. that? It all goes, bullshit. Yeah. And I, I, I swear, <laughs> it might be my imagination, but I heard him, like, whisper the N-word. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear yeah. that. <laughs> so, oh, man. I'm up and now I got to do, I do one, I go th through hell to finish this one joke and it doesn't work. I'm like, I get dry mouth. I'm like, <laughs> and then I get through a second joke. Nothing is happening. It's just deadly quiet. It's so awkward. And si it's, it's mean. The silence is mean. <laughs> and then I finish my three minute set and this piece of shit host goes, Keep going, stretch it. He he is doing this on purpose. He he sees the tragedy happening and he wants me <laughs> to continue suffering. And the problem is he's not the villain. I'm the villain. I had a fedora hat. That's what I you you forgot about this. I, had a fedora I did forget hat. about that. Yeah, yeah. There's no heroes with a fedora hat. I forgot about that. Now I'm laughing, picturing this hat again. Yeah. Oh so my I, gosh. I thought that was gonna be a cool look back then. Yeah. Then I got off the stage and I remember Tom looked at me and he said, have you considered considered magic? <laughs> I was like, I'm about oh as well. God. I already got the hat. Yeah, Tom was in that magic, doing magic trick phase. I forgot about that. But um, that was funny. He's like, magic might be more. more uh, oh, yeah, yeah. I you. don't see a lot of funny, but you seem to be talking in front of people in corporate magic. Oh, my gosh. So, you know, what's funny, uh, Andrew. He's never seen me ever since that day. <laughs> so Tom, oh my is the, Tom is the one person in my life who's like thinks I'm trash. <laughs> yeah, that's actually pretty funny. His so only I did interview with Robert is that one time at Willie's. <laughs> that's actually funny. I'm gonna send him the video. And I bet anytime I get something, on, if I get on TV or whatever, he goes, "That guy." No way. <laughs> yeah. So I interviewed Tom. He should be uh, doing that link to his in the description, but, um, he, he's pretty, uh, pretty big on TikTok. but, um, <laughs> but, but the whole thing though, with Willie's, um, what I was thinking about is, I mean, if things were reversed, you know, if Willie's was the first experience, it would have been, I mean, if it was hard to get you on stage that first time, no, 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 no one me, it would be so much harder. No one me. I, I, it had to do, it had to go well at the first time. But I think that's well, for anyone, though, Ali. Most gonna come people back. But are... here's the thing. If I did Willie's at first, I might have not done comedy for like a year. <laughs> and then and then I'll itch back again and then try something else. And then, and then if I like that, then I'll be like, oh, this is better. But yeah. I'm glad I did Acme first so I knew like there's better places. No, I am too. And but But then I felt like after Willie's, I think you were really cautious afterwards because... For that, like the rest of that year, I mean, I went to I went to every comedy show with you that first year. I only but, did seven shows that year because. But I was gonna say, yeah, that's true. You didn't go very go a lot, but I do know that, like, before you went on stage, we would either like practice in person or as a phone call. Like, yeah. you didn't do any jokes without like running them by me. And I yeah. remember you used to say, like, you'd be like, "Dude, you're like the hardest person to make laugh. Like, this is a funny joke." And then the next year, like I start traveling a lot. That's what, what happens. I start traveling a lot. So we're just like on. And that's when I got better. Here. That's when I stopped. Using exactly. You. Well, <laughs> I was going to say, like, you're like, you know what? Like, it doesn't really matter. Well, this is the important part, though. You realize like, hey, I'm doing open mics. It's really for practicing. It doesn't matter that much, you know, how, yeah. how this joke goes. Um, and, and I want to say that because I think that a lot of people don't go after their big dreams sometimes because they have one or two things that don't go well. And it's like, we amplify that so much in our mind. Yeah. Yeah. What, one valuable thing. Mm -hmm, that's a good thing to touch on. One valuable thing that I, comedy taught me is you're not great at anything. You get good at things first. Exactly. Then you become great. There's no one is born with an innate ability to be great at something, whether it's art, 
music. I mean, like there are like one of a, in a lifetime in a millennia, someone who just can pick up a, 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 the piano by like listening or hearing it or something. But most of us average human beings, you know, almost 99% of us, we just, we have to slowly, you know, build our skill set. You know, so I I was taught that, you know, like even like in school, like if you can't paint, you're just not an artist. This person is an artist. They're good at it. They didn't teach me that you can get good at art if you learn about how to go about it. Right. So yeah. we, and that's a common thing. People are just like kind of like put put us in boxes and we start putting ourselves in a box. But yeah, man, whatever it is that you want to do. Everything takes work. Boxing takes work. Comedy takes work. And Absolutely. you fail a bunch at first, and then you get you fail less as you go. Yeah, but the failure exactly. is important because it's information on how to get better. And I wanted to talk about you know for me too, like doing public speaking. Um, this wasn't something that I ever liked doing. I was definitely in that like ninety nine percent of people that fear public speaking. But mm -hmm. what I realized is that. Every time you do it, it gets a little bit easier and like a mm -hmm. little bit easier and a little bit easier. And like you still have the nervousness, you still have the fear, but it like slowly like gets smaller and smaller and yeah. smaller. And so and with a new speech, you get the same like that new fear again. And then until you get comfortable <laughs> with that speech and the, the process never ends. man. Yeah. And so that's that's a good point. And so really, you know, it all comes down to action, practice and action. And then mm -hmm. also self-reflection. Um, I know that, you know, even though you were you were kind of not <clears throat> not necessarily relying on me as much like the second year, you know, you would still do a lot of self-reflection and then we talk about it. And I think that's right. also important. And sometimes yeah. like we can be moving so fast in life. It's like that time to just go back and reflect and see how you did and, and mm -hmm. watch yourself. And that's something I do now doing public speeches. Um, not on YouTube, but public speeches that I've done. And, and I watch myself. And yeah, good. You're your biggest critic. Absolutely. If you're honest with yeah. yourself. Exactly. So let's fast forward a little bit. Um, let's get to what I would say was one of the biggest like turning points was you get invited to a comedy festival in New York at Gotham Comedy Club. And this is like, I mean, this is actually, I think, the first time you and I traveled together. I and know. It was just you and me. And uh, here's the funny part about this. So we didn't have a lot of money. I think I had just like graduated college. We did not have a lot of money. I know that. And so we, start, we stayed at the Murder <laughs> Hotel. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I want you to tell them about. So basically, I think we had to find the cheapest hotel we could. Um, so we got I want to, you to like, tell them uh, about that experience. I mean, I was excited. I, I applied for the Arab Comedy Festival. Um, I sent them a tape. And it was like, I was literally two years in, I think. Maybe a year in. Actually, a year in, because that first year, I only did like seven shows sporadically. So really, that was the first year I actually went up on a regular basis. Because I realized that's the only way I can get good, right? Uh, and then at the end of the year, October, November, we I get the approval. I was so excited. I thought it was going to change my life. <laughs> <clears throat> And I mean, it was cool. It opened, you know, I opened my, you know, my, I, first time in New York City and I felt a certain connection with New York. Me and you go, we stay in a place in Queens, like deep Queens, the non-gentrified Queens. <laughs> and and the hotel had like bulletproof bars and all this stuff. Yeah, this is this is like, I mean, yeah, when we say we were balling on a budget and by that, I mean, you don't have a Ball. lot of money, but you're yeah, balling on a budget. So, mm -mm. you know, you're trying to still do things, travel to now, New we York. We had a blast, man. We had a blast. But we had, we did have a blast. But, but the hotel, my though. favorite New York trip is the first one. Mine, too. But here's the thing. Like, <clears throat> I don't think I've ever <laughs> felt like that, though, because I've never seen a hotel like that since. I didn't even know hotels had bulletproof no, glass. It's, that place doesn't even exist. You tell people about it, they're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. So, so, so it was like. Even even the neighborhood was like you knew it was bad so too. Like cool, the neighborhood man. was so rough, but but the food was <laughs> awesome. The first place we go, it was like fly in. It's late at night. We go to like a Spanish yeah, restaurant. It was amazing, but amazing. a lot of shady looking characters in there too. Mm -hmm. I remember in the streets, so this guy's trying to sell us drugs. 
no, 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 no. He, whoa, whoa, whoa. I remember this, this part. It wasn't that he was trying to sell us drugs. He was actually he that we were, yeah, he was trying to buy. So like, that's how, you know, you're in a bad neighborhood. Like, I know. it's we're like, cool. you got a 50, 50% chance. Like those people might be drug dealers and, and give me, and I, remember, I, I just remember you were like pretending to have a deeper voice. You're like, what's up, bro? <laughs> I'm like, I just stop. Stop. he was following hey, us for a couple block for a couple blocks. Um, <laughs> But no, but that was that was definitely um it I think what made it so so like special was that it was that we knew it was like a big deal. Like we felt like, oh my gosh, this is like a big deal for you. I was you. in a, a Gotham comedy club, sold out show. I'm not you know it's funny, background story. So I was there on a Sunday show that only has headliners. They made a mistake. I was supposed to be on the new faces. The newbies, mm. that's on a Thursday. So they accidentally put me in with headliners on a Sunday show. So what we don't know is they were really nervous about this. The festival people, they're like, oh, yeah. my God, wow. this kid is going to get slaughtered. These people <laughs> are expecting headliners, and he's just going to go up. He's a new guy. And then I ended up getting like seven applause breaks. <clears throat> I had a really good set. Because I've been, I was practicing that same thing, yeah. like, you know, from one open mic to another, and da 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 da, and then I, I just had a, a really fun set, and that just kind of like, you know, made me feel like, you know, it's possible I can make it one day. Yeah, no, you, you held your own. Like, I mean, there's definitely nobody would have been like, okay, he's not like a headliner. You, you were definitely up to par I'm with them. <clears throat> I, I mean, I'm sure funny wise, I held my own, but I, I can tell if someone is new. Yeah, that might be true, but as far as audience, the trained eye, I, yeah. I look definitely new. Yeah, yeah, I I can totally understand what you're saying, but mm -hmm. still, like just audience wise, and yeah, you you did really good for someone who was accidentally put in that. And then the other thing that happens is every year after that, was it three more times or two more times? You were actually invited back to the festival. I, I until I just got invited back uh, two weeks ago. <laughs> so ever since right. that, I, I come back every year. I've been put in the headliner shows. I do three, four spots, two, three, four, three spots or whatever. And ever since, uh, you know, anyone else funny is like, there was a point in my life where I, I think I, I was going through a breakup. I was going through a rough time and it was tough to do comedy and be sad at the same time. Um, and I was almost like, I didn't know what to do with my life. And then I went back to that festival and just doing shows in New watching a show in New York and the comedy cellar and doing that festival it revived my, 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 uh, energy and my love for stand up. If you, whatever it is that you're into, it's always good to immerse yourself and, you know, people that do it at a high level. Exactly. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just, it's so, it was so inspiring to be in New York and to be at these, do these shows and be, uh, amongst these incredible, um, uh, comedians and then to watch, I don't know if you, anybody knows anything about the Comedy Cellar, but it's a top two best clubs in the country. And it's like when you go there, it's all these like Olympians of stand-up comedians, people that you, they're David Tell, famous people, you know, Chappelle goes there, Kevin Hart. That's where all they go. That's where they go to work out. So you see these incredible comics who master their craft, do stand-up. And I was watching that. I was like, that's all I want to do is just get that good. It's it pretty great. cool. Yeah. So I want to talk about uh, just a couple of things on, there is some financial stuff that happened where. Damn, things, I owe your money still? No, 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 no. Well, two things. Well, I wasn't going to talk about that, but we can touch on that quick. So one thing was, <clears throat> I do remember when, you know, you were uh, using your credit cards a lot. And it was, you know, I don't remember what you all you were buying, maybe some Jordan, something like that. But Jordan. we did have, we did have some talk. Poor. At one point, Andrew. we had a talk. Andrew, huh? Andrew, I was poor. That's what it was. I was working <laughs> at a at a smoke shop, making eight dollars an hour. I, but, does that, did I look like I could buy some Jordans? I bought <laughs> one Jordan because I won a contest once. Oh yes, I that's the time happen. when you bought the Jordan. So, but. But I do remember that there was a time this conversation. There was a good, and it was, was a good minute where Andrew was lending me money, <laughs> but, but it was like but, it was like a thing where like, hey, I get paid on Friday. I need money on Wednesday. I'll give it to you Friday. That was kind of. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I do remember having this conversation about like credit cards with you and just not 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 filling up your credit card with things just because like the travel might come up and like it came up with New York and other things. But um, I want to talk about what I want to talk about, though, on the finance part um, was you had to make a really big decision, actually. I think this is a decision that a lot of people <clears throat> might face. And you, at one time, you were doing well financially when you were a brand manager. And you had to make a pretty big decision at that time because um, that job kept you pretty busy and you weren't doing a comedy as much. You weren't. You didn't have as much time to do that. So do you want to talk about what that decision was that you had to make? Uh, well, actually I was working for AT&T and I was making, a, you know, more money than I've ever made, you know what I mean? Uh, but I, I had to take that job because my mom was going through a divorce. So I had to also help her out. Mm-hmm. But then, you know, a year or so, and she was able to take care of her own. Um, and then I still had the job and I no longer need, you know, needed to support her. Um, so I had to make a decision to like, you know, take literally half, cut my ha- half, my salary in half to do another job where I can do stand up more because I work nights all the time. So that first sacrifice was to go from making that much money to cutting it into half and adjusting my lifestyle um, and then um, getting a job that was, that was part time, but it was like five days a week, but it was more flexible where I can still do stand up. Then as I got better at stand up and more stand up opportunities presented itself, that was my cue to go, okay, I need to condense that even further. And then eventually I went from that job to uh, a real part-time job or then just work in morning shift. Then I realized <clears throat> just me putting in any X amount of my uh, uh, time at work was taken away my, from my mental capacity. My, 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 it's causing me stress. It's, 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 it's draining my soul. So I, then I realized oh man, I can't really be good at this if I'm being drained five days a week. And I'm, and I don't have, and I can use that time to, you know, write jokes and just be at a better state of uh, mental health and all that stuff. Then after that, I took on a part, an actual part-time job. Now it's 20 hours. Now I'm a, I'm a brand manager, but I'm making the same amount that I was doing full-time at the previous gig. So that was ideal. Now I drive because I, I go, I have 20 some stores, Home Depots, Menards and all these things. And I would have to drive sometimes as much as four hours to, to, to one location. That drive gave me like just space to think of bits, think about myself, reflect and stuff. I like that one the best. Um, mm-hmm. uh, then um, I was uh, uh, invited to do a Comedy Central special in, in and in, what is it, Dubai. And I, I got a decent chunk of money. And by then, I'm on Kevin Hart's Heart of the City. So I have a TV thing. I won Best in the Midwest uh, uh, contest uh, at the Laugh uh, Fest and Guild, like a big festival. And I've won two other titles uh, somewhere else. Now I have a good, decent resume. And I'm doing this part-time thing. And then this company just happened. And I got this money from the special. And this company got bought out by another company and they gave me the option. Do you want to come with us or do you want to not do that? And I've already told my boss that I'm quitting this job in a month. And you're going full time in the comedy. Yeah. And I was, mm-hmm. I had enough money and my whole idea was like, let me see if I can survive three months. You know what I mean? Like I have three months uh, of savings, so I, I don't need a job now. Like I, 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 let me see if I can make it in three months. That was like the idea. And if I can't make it in three months, I'll get a job again. And I never needed to get a job ever since. That's perfect. Yeah. Uh, to, to me, wanna... it was the end of 2019 and we're in 2021. Uh, exactly two years. It was like November of 2019. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to bring that up, that whole story, especially on the money part, because <clears throat> I think sometimes that's a hard sacrifice to make. <clears throat> For anyone to go from making fifty percent, bro, can I say something real quick? A do- I'll take a dollar of earnings of doing what I love over a hundred dollars of doing something that sucks my soul. Well, this is why I bring it up. 
that dollar stretch as well. You know? Yeah, no, no, I totally hear you. And that's, that's my point is like when I was 15 and I would read about people who are successful, I realized yeah. something very significantly different is that a lot of times they look for opportunity, not necessarily money mm -hmm. and the money comes later. And so mm -hmm. what I remember and why I brought that story up too, was there was a point when you said to me, you felt like you had regressed like a mm. full year in comedy right. because you were so busy with, with the work. It wasn't allowing you to get in as much comedy time and practice. And when you changed jobs to free up that time, the year before you got, um, you auditioned to be on Kevin Hart's show that, that year before you went like, I mean, so hard at comedy, you were doing comedy. I think it was like five to seven nights a week for a year. And yeah. The thing was, is like, I saw that difference, like between the year, like that one year, I saw the difference, um, your stage mm -hmm. presence, your um, ability to, to work the crowd. And kind of like what you said in the beginning is when somebody, you know, opens you up like that, you can handle that now. So um, yeah, yeah. I, I just bring that up because there's a value. There's like so much value in, in, in taking action and then getting in that those hours and the practice. Um, so that's why I really wanted to just touch on that because I know a lot of people, you know, probably have to make that same type of decision, but I think if like, and, and, it, and it has to be gradual, you can go yeah. I, for, I think for what I've seen, you know, for me, at least it's not, not everybody's the same, but I think it's smart to go from, unless you have savings <laughs> from like full-time, part-time, nothing. And I think if your 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 whatever it is doing is being successful, it would demand that from you. You just have to take that leap of faith. So right. like if you're if you're already making part time money doing what you like, it's telling you you don't need a full time job. So you have to be like, ah, let's not get greedy. You know what I mean? But you know, obviously there are factors like medical benefits and all that stuff. So I, you know, I understand that it's a very tough decision. But sometimes you got to bet on yourself, man. Yeah, totally bet on yourself. I think it's. Um... It's just it's so good. worth it. Dude, I, I'm telling you, bro, I've no, it changed my life. Not having a day job. <laughs> dude, I was like the first month, I was like, oh, my God, I'm getting to know myself. This is amazing. I haven't, <laughs> haven't hung out with myself uh, this long. And, you know, you start paying attention to your being, you know what I mean? Your mental health, your physical health. Uh, you really start getting like you reduce your stress so much. Uh, it helps that I'm not super like, I'm not, I don't worry about money too much. I just kind of like trust in the process and so far it works itself out. Um, but yeah, it's been yeah. good for me for sure. No, well, absolutely. Uh, what words of wisdom would you say you have for someone who is chasing their dream, dream right now? Uh, like I said, the big ones are, you know what I mean? Uh, take your time. You have a lifetime to do this. You know what I mean? You don't, you don't have, some people put weird rules like, I got to make it by 30. You know what I mean? Like, no, man, if, if, <laughs> if you're trying to do something, if you want to do something that's a career, a career is a lifetime, right? So like, take your time. Um, you don't need to be great off the top. You can learn to be great. Like everybody else follow, like go read about anybody that you respect and love and you admire. They didn't get to where they got naturally. They had to put in so much work, you know? Um, so yeah, take, tr trust this process. Don't get bitter, you know, mm. um, you know, don't be honest with yourself as much as you can listen to the people, have a, p a circle of people that you trust and listen to what they're saying. You know what I mean? If everybody's telling you, you can't there, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, but you have a circle of trust that like, Hey, we like what you're doing here. You know what I mean? Just surround yourself with people that want you to be great. that believe in you. Um, and believe in yourself, I guess. Yeah. Belief is, Good um, luck, yeah, I'm going to touch on belief in a little bit, but that is, um, so powerful. And I love all of what you said. I, I totally, um, I've seen that in so many examples in life and, and you have to have that belief. You have to put in the work and most mm -hmm. importantly, you have to be patient. Um, you, you Absolutely. know, my story of as far as like with reading and stuff, but um, yeah. when I was behind in reading, when I was young, that was actually the advice I was given by the special ed teacher was that when you're learning something new, the best thing you can do is be patient with yourself. Mm. And I still think about that to this day, 
because that was okay. such profound wisdom. And mm -hmm. um, it changed my life from an academic perspective. But in anything I do, I remember that. So great, great message, Ali. And then let's talk about you've got um, a new album coming out. Yeah, my album drops on uh, 924 and um, uh, it is uh, available for pre-download as of now. And you can hear it on Sirius XM as well. It's called Funny First. It's uh, really a lot of funny jokes. Were you there for the recording? I, th I, th I feel yes, like you were on the there. second night, right? Yeah, it was, a, it was an amazing... Stuff. Yeah, great stuff. Um, you know, I would put it, I think the first and second are both equally as good, honestly. Um, I love the first one. There are different vibes, you know. Yes. Um, both are great. This one is more punchy. Yeah, the other one's more your storyline. But, um, you know, again, yeah. either way, though. The other one was like an intro of like, this is who I am. And then the other one is like, here are some jokes. <laughs> yeah, but they're both good. But love them both. Um, yeah, I can't wait for this one to drop. Uh, I think it's going to be wildly successful. Um, Thank you. you also, like you said, were you were on the late show, uh, so I'll put that link down there. Uh, I thought that was great. Your set Thank on you. the late show, you went viral with the first joke they made a meme of, and that went viral. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's pretty crazy. Um, <clears throat> so. How can people, um, you know, follow you? What's your Instagram? At, what are your tags? At Ali Sultan Comedy is my Instagram. That's what I do most of my postings. Uh, but, you know, obviously they can subscribe to my YouTube. Uh, my website, my website is Ali Sultan Comedy and you can find everything from there. Perfect. Perfect. I'll put that in the description. All right. And then uh, lastly, bro, I have something for you. I got something for oh. you, man. So, yeah. Let me pull this out. I'm going to do like Tom and do a magic trick here. <laughs> oh, man. I thought you were going to take off uh, something else. All right. So I got you. Uh, uh, is that a shirt? The signature expanding wallet shirt. Oh, uh, I love it, buddy. You know, just as a thank you to be on the show. But, uh, you know, oh, it, says, you. it says learn, believe, grow on it, man. And and this is really I what I stand it. for. Positive message. You know? Yeah, but, you know, everything is really in life is really those three things. If you want to go after something big. Learn, um, yeah, all that. Man. Learn, believe, grow. And don't forget about the people you love. <laughs> that too. And so, yeah, when you get up there to Ali's status, don't forget about, you know, the people you love. <laughs> I'm talking but, about on a, week, on a weekly basis, bro. <laughs> Call me, Andrew. I know what you're, I know what you're saying. <laughs> Let's hang out so, sometimes. Huh? Yeah, I know. We, we got to uh, catch up now. When I reflected back on my life, and, and the lives of people like Ali, um, you know, Ali really inspired me actually to start expanding wallet because when I think about his journey and what he went through, where he came from, and even my journey, you know, sometimes I would just say people probably wouldn't bet on where we are now based on where we started. And so that's the thing about life. You know, you have the ability, regardless of where you are, to create what you want in life. It's not easy. It takes a lot of work. And so I created the five keys to success guide to really help you develop those actions and habits that you can use daily that can help you achieve those goals because success is not an accident, right? It's no accident. And so um, I'm going to put that link in the description. It's a free guide. Apply what it says in there. And one other thing is that work on your dreams. Part of why I think people don't achieve their dreams, they don't set time aside for it. You got 168 hours in a week, set an hour aside. That's 10 minutes a day, actually less than 10 minutes a day. Use the guide and, and put those things to action. Work on your dreams. Mm -hmm. To me, that's really, you know, fulfillment right there. And the money is really just a tool to help you on your journey. So yes, with that, Ali, I want to just thank you for taking the time to share with the expanding wallet community doing doing great work man i am i'm happy to do it i hope uh, this has been any of help to your community uh, i had a good time talking to you regardless oh man yeah i i think it does a lot for the community because when you share your story and people understand where you came from it does a lot um it did a lot for me hey, when man. i was reading about people in their journey
From no eggs to national TV. What up? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to make a meme out of that one. Um, <laughs> I like that. That's how you, hey, when I was a, well, this is like, a, I'll, I'll close with this real quick. Uh, maybe like a year ago, I find the guy that I used to buy eggs from on the internet on Facebook. The egg sandwich no guy. Way. No I way. I did. I found him on Facebook and I just talked to him on the phone. And then I, you know, I, I sent them a picture of my fridge with like two dozens of eggs. And I'm like, I'm oh doing all right God. now. All right. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> but uh, I'll all end right. with this for everyone. Remember, learn all that you can, believe in yourself, and take actions that allow you to grow. Peace. Don't listen to your doubts. <laughs>